Hello everyone and welcome to the video. I am joined today by the Associate Art Director of Star Trek Online, Thomas Maroney. Welcome, welcome. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited to uh, shoot the ship with you today. So today's video is going to focus a lot on Yard 39 because a couple of years ago with the beginning of Age of Discovery, it was sort of introduced as this place to get all of these discovery ships into the game and sort of explain how they were there, right? Yeah, um, if I can go into the background a little bit, I mean, the the, the thing about Yard 39, and, and first of all, the name actually came from uh, Pier 39 in San Francisco. That's a little reference. It's a kind of a tourist trap area, but um, in, in San Francisco where, you know, the Fisherman's Wharf and all that stuff is. Um, but it was just a little shout out to... Uh, to the Bay Area, but um, so the but the idea generally was, you know, we were we wanted to bring in all these new ships that were showing up in Star Trek Discovery, but of course, the first two seasons of Discovery take place um, in the mid 23rd century, um, and you don't see a lot of those starships in later eras of Star Trek. Um, it's not like the Excelsior or the Miranda that show up, you know, in the films, and then those models got reused. Uh, for decades, really, um, between uh, TNG, DS9, uh, and I mean the CG models of Excelsior and and everything uh, um, got used in Voyager. So, uh, so I wanted to come up with an excuse as to wh what happened to a lot of those ships and why we were seeing them again in the STO era, you know, in the 25th century, you know, 200 years after Discovery. Um, and so the, the 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 thing that I sort of came up with with Yard 39 was, okay, well, you know, a lot of these ships were destroyed in the uh, Kleon War, and um, so most of you know any of the ones that were salvageable will probably still being uh, rebuilt in kind of the mid uh, 23rd century, but maybe they were in one of these big um, dockyards, and some natural disaster happened that meant that. You know, they had to, everybody had to abandon that facility uh, and abandon those ships. But it had to be a type of disaster that, like, you could go back and get those ships later. And so they, they could be recovered in, you know, in the STO era, right? Because it wasn't enough that they went away, that you didn't see them anymore. You had to also have a situation where you could, people could, like, find them again and bring them back into into Starfleet and, and make new designs based on them, inspired by them. So the, so, you know, I kind of did some head scratching and, and thought about um, baryon fields, baryon radiation, um, uh, the baryon sweep from uh, Star Trek uh, uh, Next Generation. Uh, I forget the, the name of the episode, I'll have to look it up, but, but essentially it's a, it's a, Radiation that kind of uh, they expose it to the ship, and all organic matter is sort of instantly vaporized, but the ship itself is fine. And so I thought, well, what if that could have been a natural phenomenon? And and so all these ships have been kind of preserved in this uh, baryonic cloud for uh, for centuries, um, and then the you know the radiation dissipates finally, and and now Starfleet has access to all these ships again. It's definitely been interesting. Like, I love all of those ships that came out of that. I believe from that we had the Europa, Gagarin, Shran, the Buran, Edison, Somerville, Earhart, the Glen, I think, from the 10th anniversary bundle, and then the Shenzo, right? Mm -hmm. I yeah. guess all of those Discovery ships. So I yeah. guess my first question is, with the mirror somerville being the latest event ship does that mean that the mirror universe also has a yard 39 that suffered a similar fate to the one uh that's a good question i mean i, I guess uh, i would guess so you know and uh um i think that yeah you know there are a couple there are a lot of different ways you could spin that you could you could either say yes they did or they uh somehow got their hands on some uh you know uh, sto prime universe ships and decided to build their own version of those but i think i think there's enough like parallel events in the mirror universe um that are just slightly twisted right um that we can say that the mirror universe had a yard 39 and it it's uh um it similarly was recovered and and rebuilt and and reused um maybe there was a little more maybe they went in a little earlier and didn't care about all the people 
dying from baryon poisoning or whatever to to get them uh um to get those ships but um but yeah i, I definitely think it they also had a, a yard 39 okay and I know a big question that was even asked by a couple of people in the Discord server, the Gagarin being the standout ship there, since it has now shown up in Season 2 of Star Trek Picard. What is, I guess, the new sort of starting point of Yard 39? Because originally it was something that came out and was rediscovered post-Iconian War, so sometime in 2410, but... That ship showing up in Picard means that it happened a little bit sooner, I guess. So, what is the story behind it now? Was it just found, I guess, ten years earlier as far as Star Trek is concerned? How did that change the timeline? Yeah, I mean, we had to, you know, when uh, when you kind of get approached to be a part of something like Picard, um, you know, you're not, it's not really a good idea to just tell them, well... We don't have enough ships that accurate represent, you know, like ready-made that accurately represent your timeline. So we're just not going to do it, right? We're gonna we're gonna bend over backwards to use what we do have and to be a resource to them and provide them with a bunch of ships. And we wanted to obviously provide them with ships that people really that really resonated with people. So the Gagarin was one of them. Gagarin has been one of our most popular ships. Um, and then we provided a bunch of different options to, um, you know, the Sutherland is a is a a popular uh, you know variant on the nebula and um the reliant obviously a next generation version of the miranda so um so we we definitely had to do some a bit of gymnastics and retconning but you know it it, uh, it was interesting because we had to actually answer this question for um i don't know if you've seen it the space doc video that we did about the gagarin um which if you uh if anybody hasn't watched those those uh that series the X-Astra series that we've been doing in partnership with Space Doc they've been a lot of fun we just did the Kitimer recently um but we did a, a, an episode on the Garen and we kind of had to address this and so we essentially just moved the discovery of Yard 39 earlier by about maybe 15 20 years um because we sort of realized we were trying to figure out what to do about it and how to how to work it into the story and and rejigger things and we um and we sort of realized that oh um Utopia Venetia was destroyed in Picard, right? This major Federation shipyard just totally got blown up and uh, this huge facility, you know, in the heart of Federation space is they don't have it anymore. And so um the the discovery of yard 39 would be as a as much as the ships are important the actual facilities there of having all these kind of pristine shipyards the technology might be old but the the infrastructure you know if it's been just sort of sitting there for for 150 200 years like uh you know that might be a really big windfall if it happened a little earlier in in history and uh, and so then we we use that to tie it into the big inquiry fleet at the end of Picard season one, and kind of said that like after they recovered Yard Thirty Nine, the first thing they did was used it to um, pump out a bunch of inquiry ships to uh, kind of uh, bolster the Federation's defenses in the wake of you know Utopia Panisha being destroyed. Um, so it uh, we definitely had to retcon it, but I think I actually am really happy with the retcon now. I think it's actually really cool and fits in. Uh, better with you know everything that happened in Picard in, in season one, not just season two. And I'm sorry to be hitting you with all of the I guess really hard lore questions. But <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> so Utopia Planitia obviously got destroyed, and we saw it in season one of Picard. How does that affect STO now? Because I know that there are just a couple of missions that dealt with it. There was the original USS Enterprise F mission from. 10 or so years ago that dealt with it and then there was the one Klingon tutorial mission where you go there and then the synth wave which is obviously you know a flashback sort of right mission. but does Utopia Planitia still operate I guess as far as STO's timeline goes in the 2410s 2411 timeline so that's my um so I mean the nice thing is that we're still you know uh, Picard season one I believe takes place in 2399. Um, so it's still like 10 years before STO, right? Um, so I think that 
there's, you know, there's a, and even though the, the reporter says Mars still burns to this day, that doesn't mean that like people didn't, that, that nobody went there and tried to start rebuilding it and keep get, getting that under control. Like humans are kind of, uh, I think it's, um, you know, we're so, per, uh, so perseverant and, uh, and stubborn, <laughs> Um, you know, like people, I mean, you know, the hurricanes in Florida and, and floods in the Midwest and, you know, the earthquakes in California, like, like these disasters happen and people pick, pick, you know, wipe the dust off their shoes and rebuild. And, and I can't imagine that, uh, Starfleet and the Federation didn't do that with Utopia Panisha. So I, um, the missions that you talk about aren't really part of the main game thread anymore but i i don't think so the Klingon one might still be um but i'm not sure um but uh in any case it it's my uh it's my opinion that yeah starfleet has been rebuilding utopia panisha and that it's it's back online by the time of star trek online okay honestly that's really great to hear because i love shipyards and basically everything about them and i know one thing i've been talking about with a couple of people were where our Odyssey class is coming from, especially with all of the rumors, speculation about the possibility of an Enterprise F showing up in Picard Season 3. Because I know officially the original Enterprise F was Utopia Planitia, the refit, and the Yorktowns were San Francisco fleet yards from that mission patch that you made a couple of years ago. And mm -hmm. I don't know if we really knew a lot about the Lexington. Most people just assumed it was one of those two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. I hadn't really assigned a kind of a construction yard for the Lexington. Um it could be it could be that. It could be I you know, I think there are a lot of um there are a lot of tier 6 ships in my head that have a kind of a uh unique styling and so some of those I I envision as actually being like Andorian built. Um you know, ships that like the um Da Vinci actually, um the Alita ships that have that don't you know, have a slightly different look to them than the standard Starfleet saucer. Um, I think it would be fun to to assign a different point of origin for them. Um, so, you know, it could be that the Lexington is actually one of those examples where it's got, uh, it's got, you know, it started out with the the Yorktown pieces, but <clears throat> the all the additions were done in like an Andorian construction yard, like like in fleet yards or something. But all this, I mean, I do want to say all this should be definitely taken with a grain of salt in the sense of these are my feelings on it. Um, you know, we don't necessarily get into this, get into it this deep in the game. And if you have a different opinion or whatever, you know, ultimately it's your Star Trek experience. And, you know, you all can, um, when you're role playing or you're uh, doing your, having these discussions, you know, you're ultimately you're you're sort of making Star Trek the Star Trek up in your head that you want, right? And that's that's a cool thing about it. And that's something I in this new era of Star Trek that I um I like to remind people is that it's all it is all so different that it's not uh it's not the sort of coherent universe that we um I think that it used to be. But I, that isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, like Strange New Worlds is very different from Lower Decks, is very different from Picard. Um is very different from Discovery, and um, it's not. They're not treating it like the Marvel universe, where it's su supposed to be, you know, one giant cohesive uh, thing. It's just there are all these, you know, this is Discovery might not be for you, but Lower Decks is for you, and Strange New Worlds might not be for you, but Picard is for you, or whatever. And so you can, you know, it's ultimately it's it's up to you to pick and choose the things you like and you don't like, and and build these worlds in your head and uh so you can you know feel free to ignore anything i'm saying if it doesn't jive with what you had uh i mean i definitely forget that and going on the idea of headcanon another question i had for you personally is out of all of the ships that you've designed do you think there are any other ones you would say would have been built at yard 39 like say some of the other ships that might have shown up in picard like the sagan or the inquiry class in that one the curiosity class from season one that I don't believe we actually saw or the yeah we never saw that up there yeah I mean um that's a good question I mean since we moved it back certainly any number of ships could have been uh uh built there I mean that one of the cool I will um 
Uh, let me um, let me think about this for a second. I I think maybe that um, you know I could see the reliant class being built there. Some of them at least. I mean, the the thing is, you know, like you just because the first unit of a ship is built in a particular shipyard doesn't mean that like all of them are going to be built there, right? Like you can. Uh, ultimately, they're going to be transmitting these uh, things around, and so you might have the Reliant class being built at uh, you know San Francisco Fleet Yards or McKinley Station, and then some of them are being um, you know refitted into Bozeman's at Yard 39, for example. Sort of like how I guess navies operate now, where they'll start building them in one port and then tow it to another port to actually finish everything up, put everything on that it needs, center service and stuff like that, and then gets refit at a completely different dock entirely. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's exactly, like, it's, you know, it's all about where are the people and the equipment that you need to do the job you need to do, and that might be, that might be Yard 39, or it might be somewhere else entirely. Um, one thing I do when I, while we're talking about this, I mean, I'll, you know, I'll plug the, the Star Trek Adventures book, um, Utility Phoenicia, uh, Starfleet source book, um, that has, you know, it has the, the ships that appeared in Picard, the Star Trek Online ships, it has it, uh, it has those books in it. And so if you're not familiar with Star Trek Adventures, it's the, um, uh, it's the officially licensed, like, tabletop role-playing game for Star Trek that's currently running. You know, they've been, they've got a lot of supplements out now, and they're just released a new one. That's actually kind of the impetus for Fleet Week that got us talking about trying to do a um, a week to celebrate Star Trek ships because um, Modiphius was publishing this uh, Utopia Phoenicia book and it's just, you know, it's chock full. It's got like, I think 70 ships or something ridiculous uh, rules for all these ships. And there's a lot of great lore and background info for each of them. Um, and I was able to write the background info for all the, the STO ships. And I actually wrote the forward for the book too. But, um, but one of the cool things about it is one of the little entry data entry points for each ship is the different like shipyards that they were built at. Um, so, you know, if you, if you're curious about like, where did, you know, where are all the odysseys being built? It actually lists those out in, uh, in the, uh, in the Adobe Planitia book. I've been able to read through it now. I was able to get my hands on one. And I remember that the Gagarin in particular was based off of, I think food cubes Gagarin that she uses in game too. And, mm -hmm. I remember seeing the video of her reaction, and it also leads me really well into my next question. Uh, All the ships that, I guess, currently aren't in Star Trek Online, which one would you like to see in-game the most? Assuming you could just take any ship from any facet of Star Trek and add it in. Um, I probably, this is, this is going to be a really niche answer. Um, so I'm a big fan of Starfleet Command 2. Um, the old, uh, you know, Intrepid, uh, or no, Interplay. Uh, it's an old PC game published by Interplay. It's a, it's a strategy game, a real-time strategy game, where you control a few, like, a wing of starships, like three starships. Um, but it's very, the systems, like, the 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 way you control the ship, ship systems is super granular and, and involved. It's really cool. Like, you can, like, um, beam over boarding parties. You can, um, you know, adjust power levels to the tractor beam. Uh, you know, you can like use your tractor beam to intercept missiles, and then use your phasers as point defense. It's really involved. It's really cool. Um, the original, I think, is on Steam and good old games or GOG.com. Um, but so, but there are so Starfleet Command uh, one and two are both set in the motion picture era, which is my personal favorite era of Star Trek um, and Star Trek ships. Uh, and so, I would love to see some of those old designs get into STO, um, including the there's a carrier in that game called the Ark Royal that's massive, and um, it's got four nacelles. Um, it's got a really flat profile, but it has kind of almost like an island, like a real aircraft carrier, but it still looks like this awesome, big, imposing Starfleet ship. So I would love to get that into STO if I could snap my fingers and just have it there. It's, um, the, the thing is, there's no, you know, like we don't really, we're trying to stay current and we're trying to focus building out ships that are coming from the new shows, right? So there's no... If there were like a big, if there were a TV show that was set in the motion picture era, and we had, you know, and they were doing all these new ships and stuff, then we could really ride on that and and use that as an excuse. But, um, but it's it's hard to find a, a reason to put some of that stuff in the game as much as I love it. I try not to, 
uh, I try not to <laughs> force my will um, on the the ship schedule too much. You know, I try to be sensitive about what people are actually interested in. Um, and, uh, you know, and sometimes there are hits and misses, but, but ultimately I can't just say we're doing this ship because I want to do it. That's not how it works. I, you know, and we've got, we've got a lot of people who, uh, who contribute to that decision process. Um, so, you know, uh, but, uh, but yeah, the, the arc oil from Starfleet command Two, the similarly, the Okinawa class from Starfleet command Two. um, both those ships, I think are really awesome, uh, examples of Star Trek ship design. And uh, I would love to see them in STO someday. Okay. And I guess going right off of that, going into ship design, I guess at least for like the original designs, what sort of goes on when you're making these ships? I've watched a couple of the live streams where you were, you know, working on new skins or working on new ships, but I guess what's the design process overall for some of these newer ships that you have to do? Yeah. I mean, I, and I've done a, um, I've done a, I did a video for Autodesk that uh, kind of goes from the very beginning to the very end, like of starting with the, the concept and the, you know building the model and texturing the ship, and it's it's a very involved video. Um, uh, I will I'll send you a link to it if you want to post it in the show notes or something. Um, it's like it's like half an hour long, like it it uh, goes through the whole process. But I mean, ultimately, you you're essentially you the very first thing you do is you decide, okay, what are we going to make. Right, we're like you gotta make a decision about like, okay, what is this? Uh, what's the ship that we want to make? And um, uh, you know, like I think Mike uh, announced the Farragut uh, the other day, right? And so, you know, we're like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna make the Farragut from Strange New Worlds. And so, the the second thing that you talk about once you make that decision is you you decide like. Um, well, the ferret is kind of a bad example because it's canon, but but essentially, let's um, let's step back a bit and let's say that we're gonna make a, um, uh, you know, let, let's go back to the Garen, right? Like we're gonna make we're gonna take the Shepherd class from Star Trek Discovery and we're gonna build that out, but we're gonna make a but we want to make a modern version of it, right? So you 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 basically the first thing you do is you sort of de define the box that you're working inside of. Um, and so either that's from it's going to be like this canon design, but but modernized or it's going to be, well, we just need a new Starfleet carrier and we're starting from scratch. So it can be whatever we want it to be. But we know it needs to be a carrier, which means it needs to be big. It needs to have, you know, hangar doors and stuff like that. Right. So you're, de you're defining the box. So the, the second stage is then you, um, uh, you know, you have a really talented concept artist like Hector Ortiz. Um, start doing a bunch of sketches. And so Hector, uh, probably one of the best ship artists out there in terms of designing starships. Uh, really, you know, we are really lucky that he works <laughs> works for us. We're really lucky to have him on the team. We've been really lucky to have him on the team for the last, uh, God, I think eight years. Um, but uh, he, um, he does a bunch of sketches, so he does really quick, like top-down thumbnails, very loose drawings, or just line work usually, maybe a little bit of shading here and there. Um, and he'll do like literally dozens of them. So like, um, and and they might have you know this, they might have the same saucer, but this one has slightly different cells, or this one has a you know the 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 hull is a bit longer, or or, or the the pylons are different shapes. Um, and essentially what that's about is kind of figuring out what we do when we don't want. And so you're looking at this, you know, buffet of choices and you're like, well, I like the saucer there that has the arrowhead shape. Um, but I don't like the nacelles it has. I want to do those shorter nacelles, um, on, you know, like, like let's, let's say the saucer is on number 12 and the shorter nacelles are on number 31, right? Like, so then you start like taking all these things that you like and, and talking about the things you like and you don't like. And uh, and then you and you start to coalesce into a direction, um, and then Hector eventually will will go from uh, the the sketches, and then he'll start doing a a block out, a rough three D model. Uh, we might call it like a white box model. Um, essentially, it's just a a very like a low detail, um, a very rough version of the ship that kind of uh, shows us what the shapes are like in three D, so that we can spin it around, look at it from any angle and, and see if the, the sketch, you know, translates well into 3D. Because with Star Trek Online, you have a great, um, 
you know, you, you can look at the ship from any angle. Players can look at the ship from any angle. You know, with the with Enterprise D and the, the big physical miniatures, you know, they basically had just certain ways they could mount the ship and certain ways they could shoot the ship, but, um, you know, with the, with the motion control cameras and stuff. And so that meant that, like, there were good angles and bad angles, but they had they had very uh, pretty tight control over how they presented it, right? We don't have that kind of control uh, when we're building ships in STO because you all can look at the ship from any direction you want because it's a video game, you know, a, a polygonal 3D video game. Um, and so, so we have come to design our ships in 3D to make sure that we like the, the angles of the ship, you know, as many angles as we can uh make them make them good so uh so you have that um so you have that 3d blockout model and then hector takes that and and starts adding details and refining and kind of comes up with the uh the final illustration he traces on top of the the 3d model and, and fills in all the panel lines and colors and all that stuff so it's a you know it's a very multi-step process um and hector has it down to a to a science I remember one of the old ships. I'm trying to remember which one it was. I think it might have been way back with the Jupiter Carrier, seeing a lot of those sort of pieces come into play back when you had, I think we had four or five sketches to choose from, and then you kept going on that design, and there were streams and stuff where you guys would show off what you were working on until we finally got the final design. Yeah. I guess yeah. the general question, I don't know if you can answer this or not. Is there going to be more of that in the future where, you know, you have designs and you say, choose this next ship, but we're not going to tell you what it is or what it's for. Um, I think that's a quite, if you guys want to see that more of that, you know, I think that's something you can talk to Mike about. Um, uh, uh, Kale will, uh, you know, that's, that's the kind of feedback he's listening for. And if we get a, a lot of support for it, you know, the, the, the thing about that is, um, it is, it takes way longer for us to do it that way than to just, design ourselves um there's a lot we have to we have to do a lot more work to get each stage of the design more presentable um you know have to wait for the voting back and forth so it's something you know if we decide to do it we're essentially it's something we need to do like i don't know six months to at least uh, ahead of the ship actually being um maybe not six months but but certainly many months before the ship going live and uh so um it's you know and then the, the other the other problem with those is um there are people who see contests like that and then and they they get upset because their version didn't get picked uh and then you know i remember that people even claimed that we rigged it um last time when we did the jupiter there was a lot of drama about it because because it didn't go the way certain people wanted and so you know if the goal everything we do has a goal right like you're you know, your business, your goal is to uh, to grow your business or uh, and obviously give people jobs. But, you you know, we're also here to create a game and games are supposed to be fun. And we want people to have fun playing our games. And we want people to be engaged. And if the goal of this community design a ship collaboration is for people to have fun and feel engaged and feel like they have a voice. But if if most of the people come away from that experience feeling better that the version they like didn't get picked then we didn't really meet our goal right that the thing didn't it kind of backfired um so i don't know mike is really the person to talk to on that in terms of what the the overall sentiment of it was but i know sometimes that that whole contest still gets brought up in kind of a bitter vein um and uh and i say i think that's made us a little gun shy maybe to try it again but but you know we we did actually do it uh i remember we did it with the um the rise of summership and i thought that went pretty well i think that was that one uh went a little better than the the carrier so i don't know maybe we'll do it again in the future but uh but it's also something that we kind of are a little uh sensitive about i i definitely understand that and i remember the odyssey class was a similar thing where it was a contest to design it and now as far as looks, it's one of the most popular ships in the game. Just a couple of days ago on a stream, we did the 10-person crystalline catastrophe TFO with a fleet exclusively made up of Odyssey variants. Oh, fun. That's great. That's really cool. Yeah, it's been, I mean, I, you know, I was around, I've been on the team for almost 12 years now, and uh, I was, uh, it'll actually be 12 years in November. Um, 
and uh, I so I was around when we were doing the whole designing Enterprise F contest, and I remember uh, how controversial it was when it came out, and uh, it's uh, you know it's it's been great to see it kind of evolve in people's estimation from from oh that's ugly that's weird I don't like it to being you know like this is my enterprise right you know we've it's it's certainly had its own arc uh, over the years. I remember the responses to rumors that it would show up in Picard season three were all if it doesn't I'm going to be so sad and I can't <laughs> wait to see the Enterprise F on screen. I remember when it showed up in the Picard prequel comic, uh Picard's flagship, the Verity. Mm -hmm. A lot of STO communities exploded with excitement. Yeah, yeah. That was I mean that, that was a great uh opportunity for us to work with uh, idw and um you know they were doing the picard countdown comic and they reached uh, it, like we had a um a good relationship with them and uh we offered to provide a ship for them because they said that picard needed a new ship and um and so we gave them a bunch of options and the, the odyssey was the one they chose and that was obviously very exciting for us and it felt great to see it in the comics and of course that also required uh a certain amount of uh, retconning, but you know, that's again, it's you don't, you can't, you can't pass up those opportunities. You just have to, to think of ways around it because you, you, you want, you want to see these ships that you work so hard on. Uh, you want to see them enter the broader Star Trek consciousness, right? Um, that's something I, I feel very strongly about is that we've done a lot of really, really good work on Star Trek Online with these ships, and um, and so whatever I have to do to get that recognized and, and see that work uh, appreciated by more than just the SDO player base. I'm going to do that. And, uh, you know, we got really lucky with Dave Blass, who who saw some, I mean, like I asked him, like, how did you, you know, what, like, how did you even think about using SDO stuff? Because he reached out to me, um, which, you know, was, was kind of wild. But, you know, he, he was like, well, I was just... I, I knew we needed more ships and the the um the fleet at the end of a card season one that there was a fan reaction to that because there wasn't a lot of variety and we didn't want to do that in season two. Uh we wanted to have more variety, but the you know, but we also didn't have an infinite amount of time or money to build these ships. And so uh and he said he was just kind of looking through the internet for Star Trek ships and he kept coming across cool ships and he's like, What's that from? Star Trek Online. What's that from? Star Trek Online. What's that from? Star Trek Online. And so uh so he sort of realized that we had, you know, a big library that we were sitting on of great Star Trek ships. And Dave's a fan, Dave's a really passionate Star Trek fan and he understands that language in a way that um, you know, I think is is uh is very specific. It's it's a very specific start like language, uh, visual language, <clears throat> and Dave uh, Dave gets it. And so, uh, him reaching out to us, uh, he he knew that we understood it too. Um, and so that was yeah, that, that, that's kind of the rest is history. But um, but I think it kind of it speaks for speaks for itself. Yeah, I think my last question would then be. How was the decision made as far as which ships showed up in Picard when you were approached about bringing some of these ships into canon and having them in the show? Was it a, we're looking for a cruiser, a frigate, one of these, one of these, or was it a just, you brought out a long list of ships and which ones look the coolest? Yeah, I mean, uh, it was, essentially I I went through and looked at some of our popular ships, like I mentioned the Gagarin um their alliance um <clears throat> and uh and we went through and um i put together a graphic of like here's a bunch of different sdo ships that we could give you you know that the concord was in there actually as a, a thing we pitched to them um and then they just sort of made a selection of you know we have the budget to transition x number of ships over from you all so and they wanted cannon ships too so we gave them so that the model of the sovereign and the akira in picard is actually our model is the star trek online model um, I think even the model of the inquiry I think they started with our model and they made some changes to it um, so uh, so we gave them some cannon ships and we also gave them our new you know our custom or our, our SDO original designs 
um, and and they just kind of picked the ones that they liked. Um, the the Concorde didn't make it because it had four nacelles, and they wanted to make sure that the Stargazer was the only ship with four nacelles. Um, but uh, but the Gagarin and the Ross and um, the Reliant uh, and the um, Sutherland, uh, they all I think they liked those because they had a clear heritage with existing Starfleet designs. Um, and they were they were well constructed, like the model. I mean, like the other thing that I did um, was, you know, I used that. That combined with the fact that we were doing the Mu Universe arc was a, a major impetus for me to remaster a lot of those ships. Right? Uh, you know, the Ross is new; it didn't need didn't need to be remastered. But the Sutherland and the um, Reliant certainly did. And then the Garen uh, was was in pretty good shape, it, but it got like a little detail touch up. But but it was a confluence of events of having um, uh, uh, the opportunity and and the drive to clean up our Federation ships so that they could use them for Picard, but also so that they'd be ready to be mirrorified in the uh, you know in our mirror arc. So it all kind of worked out. I'll definitely say I've been a huge fan of all of the ship remasters and. The Type 7A hole looks amazing on every ship I've used it on. Thank you. I'm glad you, you're liking it. But I think that's all of the questions I had. Uh, did you have anything else you wanted to say for Fleet Week? Um, yeah, just uh, I think thanks everybody for participating, and, and uh, I hope you all uh, have a great, great week. I can't wait to um, uh, see you all on Admiralty Day. Uh, October 15th. Um, we'll be starting at uh, 11.30 in the morning Pacific time, and uh, we're going to kick it off with a great uh, little concert with uh, Craig Huxley, who's going to you know, use his blaster beam from Star Trek The Motion Picture, the, the voice of V'ger. Um, he's going to do a little demo with Mike, and then we'll go right into our um, first panel, which I believe is the science of Star Trek. Uh, Amy Emhoff's running that uh, with Dr. Uh, Mohammed Noor and Aaron, Dr. Aaron McDonald, and they're gonna, you know, I, and Rick Sternbach. Uh, you know, the, the the caliber of people, the guests we've gotten for Fleet Week and Admiralty Day, um, you know, is it kind of surprised me, frankly. <laughs> I was, you know, reached out to these people and they were all really excited to do it. And uh, I was like, oh, well, that's great that, you know, we're going to have we're gonna have some great, great discussions. So, um, you know, and then it's going uh, it's going all the way through to um, uh, five o'clock. We're going to have different panels. And so, um, yeah, I just hope to see everybody on Admiralty Day and hopefully they'll check out everything else going on throughout the week. But I really appreciate uh, the enthusiasm and the excitement around the event, and I can't wait to just kind of celebrate Star Trek, Star Trek ships with you all. I can't wait either, and the links to everything going on in Fleet Week will be below, and links to Thomas's YouTube channel and his Twitch will be up in the right-hand corner, assuming I remember how YouTube works. <laughs> I don't really, I don't really have a YouTube channel. You can link to my Twitch if you want. I haven't gotten a chance to stream in a while, but um, but you can link to my Twitter. Um, that's where I'm most active. Uh, um, but yeah, so um, uh, but I, I really appreciate the opportunity to to chat about Fleet Week and Yard Thirty Nine. And I was actually really excited that you had a very specific thing you wanted to talk about. Um, uh, you know, for ship lore and stuff. I hope people enjoyed the the deep dive into it. I am a massive fan of ship lore. I'm pretty sure about 30% of my comments on Twitter have just been the words, did someone say ship lore in all caps? <laughs> awesome. But thank you everyone for tuning into the video. I have been on the air with Thomas Maroney, the associate art director of Star Trek Online. Thanks so much. Live long and prosper, everybody.